I asked Cecilina to come and do this, and um, I said, I'll never ask you to do another thing for me if you come and do this. She, she introduced me in Panama. We had like an impromptu thing for patients, and there were about, I don't know, 60 people that came to it. And the introduction was just almost made me cry. So I thought, who better to introduce me but Cecilina? So I said, oh, you just do this one thing for me. I don't know how many more lectures I'm going to give, but I would really love you to come do this. And then you also have to do my funeral in case you outlive me. <laughs> thank you, Cecilina. And thank you to our other speakers, uh, Dr. Paz, Dr. Shapiro, Dr. Ozarker. And thank all of you for coming. Um, there's, there are a lot of people here that I know, a lot of people that I don't know. But I would encourage you to talk to other people while you're here in our short time together. There are a whole lot of people here who have been to Panama. There are a lot of people here that have been treated here and learn from their experiences. <clears throat> so I'd like to start with three years ago, right about now, I, was, I went to my, I have a little ranch non-functional piece of dirt that has a little house on it it's up by the Oklahoma border and we suffer from a pig problem up there and the pigs root out everything everything they can and so I had recently bought a gun I, I grew up in Kansas you'd think I'd grow, grown up with guns but I, I didn't you know and in Texas I think it's a law you have to have one so <laughs> especially if you have pigs so I had no experience. I bought this gun and I went up to my ranch. I had this little picnic table out there and I was sighting it in. You know, I have like a target and stuff, so I was just learning how to fire this rifle. And I got a, a call from my best friend in Wichita, where I grew up, and uh, said, What you doing at the ranch? It's a beautiful spring day. I'm sitting on the picnic table shooting imaginary pigs. and. Uh, and then during the conversation, we were talking for about 20 minutes. During the conversation, I started to feel hot. And I, and I said, yeah, man, I'm hot. And then he goes, well, is, can you smell OK? And I go, yeah, it smells a little bit funny. And he goes, well, I was going to stay out there the weekend. And he said, don't stay out there the weekend. Go home. So I went home, and then my, my uh, son took me to the emergency room. And I had COVID. And the, the treatment at that time was, I think you have COVID. I got nothing to give you. This was March of 2020. Go home, and when you can't breathe, go to the hospital. <laughs> and I said, you know, there's nothing? He said, nothing. Um, so I went home. My son was bunkering here from New York. He and his girlfriend were staying at my house because New York was sort of a bloodbath at the time. People were dying, dropping like flies. And so, Dutifully, as the doctor uh, said, I started having breathing troubles and my son took me to the hospital. And uh, the last thing I remember was being hooked up to uh, oxygen and all the, all the bells and whistles with the EKG and everything. And I texted Georgie, Jorge, Dr. Paz, and I said, I'm on six liters and I'm, I have 81% oxygen. Anyway, so they, they had to intubate me. They put me under for, I was, I was in a coma for three weeks. My, uh, I don't remember any of this. I'm told afterwards. So when I woke up, my daughter was there. I had been intubated and ECMO'd. So that means my immune system was attacking my, my lungs to get rid of the virus. And in, in, the, in the process, it was destroying what was left in my lungs. And they had to put me on this bypass machine where it take blood out, and it oxygenates it and puts it back in. And they argued over whether they are going to put me on it. They had transferred me from Grapevine, which is close to my house, down to Bumsey, which is Baylor University Medical Center down in Dallas, because they didn't have the stuff to take care of me up here. And they, put, they took me down there, and I was on ECMO. They, they said, we need to put them on ECMO. And apparently there was an argument with the doctors. And this, this little female pulmonologist fought for me. And she said, I think this guy deserves a chance. They had lost 37 in a row. First 37 people on ECMO didn't make it. With ARDS, without ECMO, the survival is less than 50%. Not just then, but carrying on. 
they've gotten a lot better, but for the first year it was less than 50% survival for somebody on a ventilator, and then in some cases it was low as 5% for ECMO. So anyway, I woke up, my daughter was there, she's a PA, and at that time they didn't let people in the hospital. I have a lot of friends, some of them in powerful places, and they were able to get my daughter in there. When I got out, um, I was, I weighed about 60 pounds less, I had no muscle, it took me three months to be able to walk. And at about, after about six months, I was pretty good, and I went back to the infectious disease doctor, the guy who was there with me every day in the hospital, and he actually got an, um, a non-approved drug to treat me. The whole time I was in there, my kids are saying, and my colleagues are saying, give him umbilical mesenchymal stem cells. He has plenty of them. <laughs> and we know that they treat inflammation, and this boy is inflamed. And they made calls, and they, they called politicians, they called the, everybody in the hospital system, and ultimately they got a dose of umbilical MSCs shipped to the hospital. The day before that, my, before the cells got there, my brother started a pharmaceutical company called Gilead Sciences. So my whole family was working to try and get me better. And they had a drug that inhibited, inhibits inflammation and it, I don't know, tocilizumab is the name of it. So I was the first COVID patient to get tocilizumab, mainly because of my brother's in intervention. And thank God, the tocilizumab, what it does is it blocks all your receptors to this interleukin-6, which is an inflammatory molecule, and that was enough for me, and I survived. So when I went to the doctor, oh, well, thank you, thank you. So when I, when I went back to the infectious disease, I'm relatively healthy, and he said, well, you're not supposed to be here, but you are, what are you going to do? So at that time, I, I, I made the commitment to myself that my the entire rest of my existence is going towards getting mesenchymal stem cells available to as many people as possible in the world. So. So uh, I'm here to talk about some other stuff. Uh, what you know, what it is we do in Panama. I think you guys pretty much got a pretty clear picture on that right now. Um, what makes us different from other places that do stem cell treatment? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about why you know that, that all stem cells aren't created equally and what, what we do differently. And you know, we were going to. We had a guy that was going to come here. His name's Corey Elliott, and he's a uh, he he's he's a public speaker, and he got very very ill. And these are this is a picture of him before he came to Panama. He had ulcerative colitis. He could eat nothing. He could absorb virtually nothing. And he this is him on the left, and on the right is the after picture. So. He, he was unable to make it. He was snowed in in Canada. Apparently, he's a big snowstorm summer. But anyway, thank you, Corey, for agreeing to come. And uh, sorry you're not here. But I showed your picture, and uh, you're pretty badass dude, man. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about MSCs like a little bit holistically. So I have to go back to the beginning. When we are conceived, mama has an egg. Daddy's got a sperm, sperm gets in there, penetrates the egg, the genetics are mixed, and then you have an, the egg turns into an embryo, and the embryo is one cell. That, well, that cell divides to two, to four, to eight, 16, 32, 64. At that point, if you take one of those cells out, it's an embryonic stem cell, and it has the ability to become any tissue in the body. And for 20 years and billions of dollars, the industry, when I call it the industry, of uh, people studying stem cells spent billions of dollars on the embryonic stem cell. And as Dr. Paz alluded to, they, the, the final nail is in the coffin. 
They don't work. They basically want to be a baby, right? So now those 64 cells grow into 110 trillion cells, and this miracle of a baby comes out, and the umbilical cord is clamped and cut, babies sucking on mom's teat or whatever, and then the rest of the, the afterbirth comes out, the placenta and the umbilical cord and the amnion. Well, those cells that are in that tissue are very young cells, and that's what we work with. We use the umbilical cord from, not from babies. Dr. Paul said babies are donated. No babies have been donated. I think it slipped. <laughs> the babies are fine. This is the, the other stuff that they typically throw away. That gets donated, and that's where we derive our cells from. And Dr. Paws had this slide up there. The main reason for this slide is that's the body exhibit on the right. That's where they took a poor Chinese prisoner and they filled his blood, his bloodstream with some plasticizing agent and then they dissolved the rest of his body. But the reason it's there is to illustrate that, that your blood vessels are found everywhere and you can see organs and tissues in your body because blood vessels are everywhere in your body and MSCs are therefore everywhere in your body. So they reside on the, on, on the blood vessels throughout your body. So they're everywhere in your body. And I had another slide, but I don't know, did I miss it? Okay, well, I didn't talk about the other two types of stem cells. They're very important, they all work together. Your HSCs are in your bone marrow, M MSCs are also in your bone marrow and everywhere there's a blood vessel. And then you have tissue-specific stem cells. So your liver has stem cells in it, your lungs, your, your heart, your intestines, your skin, your cartilage, your bone, muscle, everything. Everything has a tissue-specific stem cell. It's dedicated and what it's there for is to regenerate that tissue. You know, you can cut out 80% of your liver and it will regrow because it's so rich in tissue-specific stem cells. It's so rich in, rich in blood vessels. Therefore, it's very rich in MSCs as well and it can completely regrow. So these cells all work together. Your, your HSCs produce your immune system. They produce your white blood cells, your red blood cells, your platelets in case you're in an accident, keep you from bleeding to death. So that's what, all these cells keep us who we are for the remainder of our lives. And they, Dr. Paw showed three things here. They control inflammation, they modulate the immune system, they stimulate regeneration, but they also provide energy to the cells. So for example, if you have, anybody had an infection and had an elevated white count? Well, when you get an infection, your white count goes up. Well, that happens, it's a miracle that it happens. Because it happens within less than 24 hours, you go from having a normal white count to an extra 500 billion cells in your bloodstream that are there to help you fight infection. Where does the energy come from that? I mean, it's unbelievable. Well, the MSCs in your bone marrow divide very rapidly and they donate their mitochondria, which are the things that make your cells that, that create energy, and they donate them to the HSCs and the progenitor cells that ultimately become those white blood cells. Without the MSCs, you wouldn't have an immune system. Without the HSCs, you wouldn't have an immune system, but they work together. So I've said this before, and I've been criticized for this, but I stand by it. I believe the majority of chronic illnesses are due to either a decreased number of MSCs and all stem cells or a dysfunction of those stem cells and resulting in increased inflammation. In my case, when I was in the hospital, by golly, I had some inflammation, right? I also, my immune system was completely dysregulated because it wouldn't shut off. Um, they, you, you have decreased ability to regenerate. So if people have osteoarthritis, guess what? You don't, you're not regenerating enough to repair the problem. Decreased, decreased energy, as I just described. And this, Roberta took this from uh, Dr. Kaplan and presented Dr. Shapiro. And this is, I, so I didn't have to pay him anything. I, had, I reworked it with an artist. <laughs> Arnie's a good friend, by the way. But this is that same thing. And the main point that I like to take away from this that Dr. Spiro mentioned is that by the time you reach skeletal maturity, 90% of the oomph of those MSCs is gone. 90% gone by the time you reach skeletal maturity. And then it gets 
very depressing out there in the 80s somewhere. So this is like a theoretical curve that I had in my book, and it's just basically you have sort of maximal stem cell potency until about 25, and then they start declining uh, until, you know, about 100, most people have very, very few left to none. Uh, if you have a, I put this other curve in here where you have a, a, a deep decline, if you have a terrible auto accident and your pelvis is smashed, well, guess what? You're going to, you have to burn up a lot of your stem cells to repair it. If you have a heart attack, you're going to burn up a bunch of stem cells. You have cardiovascular, you have a, you have a stroke. Uh, any number of, of things could cause an immediate withdrawal of the, bank, uh, the bank account of your stem cells, and then you could be on a different pathway. So why th this slide shows a couple things, but if you take newborn MSCs and you grow them in, in the lab, if we take, and we do this in the lab all the time, we take one umbilical MSC, this was actually done with cartilage, Cells, but it, you take one umbilical MSC and they divide every 24 hours. So that's pretty cool, right? And if you do the math on that, if one cell becomes 2, 4, 8, 16, go on out down the road, in 30 days you have a billion cells from one cell. And if you're 35, 40 years old, that doubling time goes from a day to two days, which sounds like, oh, it's only half as much. So there's only 32,000 cells after 30 days. And when you're my age, your doubling time goes up to like two and a half days. And that depressingly leads to 4,000 cells after a month of that same cell. So what I like to say is, if you have a, if you have a million cell problem and you're only making 30,000, probably you're not gonna get over it. In fact, if you have a million cell product, a problem and, and you're producing 900,000 cells, guess what? You're still not going to get there. You're not going to get complete healing. So there are a couple cool studies. Uh, one was at Harvard where they took uh, old mice and they, they literally tied, sutured them to young mice. And the old mice had problems with, you know, with cognition. They had problems with their skeletal muscle, their heart muscle. And they tied them together and they shared the blood supply between them. And incredibly, these old mice being exposed to the secretions of the cells from the young mice got, behaved much younger. They had an increased capacity to repair skeletal muscle, neurogenesis in their brain improved, uh, myocardial function improved, everything got better. Not to, not to complicate things, but also the younger mice got older, but that's a different subject. A different. <laughs> So, and then the, the second one, I, I, we did this, I did this my, on myself personally, just took some of my MSCs and put them under, uh, put them, growing them up, and then they have, my, 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 uh, my doubling time was 36 hours, which is pretty good for somebody my age, but then we put, just took juice from umbilical MSCs, the, the stuff that they secrete, MTF, which was, Jorge was talking about MTF. We took MTF from the secretions of these cells and then put it on my, my cells, and it went from 36 hours to 18 hours. So the secretions of the young cells can make your stuff work better. You don't, you don't need actually the cells. And this, this myth of when, when we were looking at MSCs years ago, you would, we would tease up a, a liver and give cells to the mice and then we would follow those cells radiographically and you find them in the liver, and the liver would get better. So we just assumed they're becoming liver cells. And then we'd you know, give, a, give a rat a heart attack, inject the cells, they go to the heart, and the heart would get better. Well, we thought the, the cells were turning into cardiomyocytes and repairing the heart. Uh, brain, brain injury, do the same thing. The cells go there and they secrete stuff. But in the end, and there are probably 15 studies I could cite right now where when you actually look at the tissue, there are no cells there. It's just they've been there for a period of time and they responded to the environment. Whatever was missing, they put it in. So, so knowing what you know now, would you rather have, like, older cells are slower, older cells are less potent, younger cells make, younger, older cells behave younger. What would you rather work with? 
A younger cell or an older cell? Young, go young. So it's all about the secretions. Um, there are lots of products that these cells secrete. And just those, just those secretions can be very, very useful. And, and we are working on, on indications for just using the secretions. The cells, on the other hand, the benefit of the cells being in the body is they sense what's going on and they react. So Arnie calls this a, Dr. Calvin calls this MSC an injury drugstore. <clears throat> so, I, I call them, I think they're a, uh, they're, they're a doctor, they're a, they're a pharmacist, and a manufacturing facility all in one because they, they go to wherever the problem is, they sense what's going on, they say, oh, you're producing too much inflammatory stuff here, I'm going to secrete this. You're not regenerating fast enough, I'm going to secrete this. So they respond to the environment in, in the body. That makes the cells way more powerful, in my opinion, than just injecting the secretions of the cells. So these are some of the ways that they respond. They inter interface with the, with the different white blood cells, the immune system on the left, and they, they, in they enhance mitosis. They decrease that doubling time, so your own cells can, can turn over faster. They decrease the scarring. They decrease cell loss through uh, programmed cell death. Um, they stimulate angiogenesis or new blood vessel growth. So, you know, if you're in a, you know, if you've just had a massive cut on your leg, in order for it fully heal, it's going to have to revascularize because you've cut through the blood vessels. So normally what happens is the MSCs will jump off of the, the blood vessels they were hanging on to and they become activated and they secrete these things to stimulate the regeneration. And this one, there would be no tests on this, but these are just some of the molecular signals they have. And the most important one for autoimmunity is this one right here at the bottom where this inhibition of... Um, this inhibition of conversion from, or, or this, pr, pr, they press M1 macrophages, which are the ones that are kind of the bad guys for inflammation, and they stimulate them to become M2. M2 secrete things that are anti-inflammatory. So they say, oh, there's way too much M1, let's force them to be M2, and the inflammation decreases. So, so I talked about my case when I, uh, I was on a ventilator and getting my blood pump full of oxygen. Uh, a few months after I got out of the hospital, University of Miami has a robust program. Dr. Camilla Ricordi, who's a friend of ours, uh, decided because of this massive inflammatory thing. And the, stem, the MSCs, when you give them IV, guess where they go first? To the lungs. So they had all these people that were just dying in front of them. And he said, why don't we give some of them MSCs? I've got them right there. Because he has a GMP manufacturing lab for other clinical trials that he was doing. So what they did is they took these, and it was not, wasn't a whole bunch of patients. It was only 12 patients that were treated and 12 patients that were given saline. And, but the results were astounding. Um, only one of the 12 died in 30 days if they got the cells. And that one person was 84 years old. So um, if you're under 80, you're banging, you know, you're banging 100%. And then the, of the other 12, seven of them died within the first 30 days. So, um, and, and, it, and it all has to do with inflammation. So they did these blood markers of, I, I said, you know, I, the only words I'm going to introduce to you today are interleukin-6, IL-6, and TNF-alpha, because they're the two commanders of the, basically of the immune system, right? And so... If on the left are, are the on the in the green, those are the those are the patients who received the MSCs, and on the left is at time zero, and the, on the right is day six, and you can see on day six the TNF alpha over here is greatly reduced from here, and then in the in the saline group not a lot, and here's the IL or no this is IL six, and then here's TNF alpha, the commander of inflammation. Greatly, get greatly reduced. The, the biggest thing these cells do is they decrease inflammation, they retrain the immune system. And for the, the myriad of autoimmune diseases that are treatable, uh, they, the cells work kind of all the same way. If, if you, and I'm gonna show a study on rheumatoid arthritis here in a second, but if you inject IV cells into somebody with rheumatoid arthritis, well, first of all, you measure their, 
their T regulatory cells, which I've introduced another word, sorry, but th there's this cell, it's kind of like a mothering cell for the immune system, and it says, hey, stop it. It's a T regulatory cell, it regulates an, a runaway immune system. And people with runaway rheumatoid arthritis don't have very many of them. And you give them a single infusion of human umbilical MSCs, and their T regulatory cells go through the roof. And the T regulatory cells tell the, tell the other, the inflammatory cells of the immune system, say, hey, quit it. In this study, it, it took 172 patients with rheumatoid arthritis. They gave them a single treatment, 60 million cells, and they all got better. There were no serious adverse events. And after one treatment, their TNF-alpha reduced by 50% and their IL-6 reduced by 50%. I don't know if you guys watch TV anymore. Is that a thing? <laughs> but anywhere you can advertise, you'll see advertisements for medications called, that are anti-rheumatics. And they're Humira, Embril, and Teracep. Those are all antibodies to TNF-alpha. And then there are new ones that are antibodies to interleukin-6. And boy, do they, they're magical. You know, if you've got elevated TNF-alpha, everything hurts and you get a shot of this stuff, and guess what? All of it's bound up and taken out of the system, and you feel great. Problem is, it doesn't last, you know, because the, the source hasn't been retrained at all. There, nothing's been done to the source, so the body just keeps producing TNF alpha, and guess what? You gotta have another shot in six weeks, or eight weeks, or 12 weeks, or whatever it is when you're feeling like crap again. And then ultimately, we, we make antibodies to the antibodies, and then, like, Unfortunately, at some point, they, they become ineffective. So I get this question a lot about, well, I got this question three times uh, today outside. It was how, how long did the cells last? That's a really good question. I have no idea. I mean, we know they last for a while in the body, but at some point they're cleared by the immune system. But how long do they last and how long do the effects last is kind of a more relevant question, right? So how long do the effects last? This is a wonderful double-blind placebo -col control, randomized control trial of type 2 diabetics that were on insulin, on medication, and they gave them a single treatment of 120 million cells, and then they followed them for three years, very religiously, and they took all their blood work, and I just want to show you this is where I get my number from for chronic adult, what I would call mesenchymal exhaustion syndromes, which this is where I lump uh, type 2 diabetes is when the immune system, or when the MSCs just quit functioning as well as they could. So they gave the single treatment, and you can see the post prano that's after a meal glucose, dropped significantly, and at six months it was a significant difference, and that persisted for really the, the, the significance on it, there's a little star by it, it was significantly different 18 months later. And these patients, the amount of insulin they were using was dropped by 80%. They got better glucose control. They weren't non-diabetic, but their medication costs plunged. And then the hemoglobin A1C, which is like a, it's a snapshot of your blood glucose for the last three months, also dropped. And really the, the zenith there was at six months, and it lasted for up to 27 months, still significantly different. So when somebody asks me, and they're going for frailty of aging, how often do you need to get treated? I literally have no idea, but this gives me an idea that maybe somewhere between every 15 and you know, 27 months seems reasonable. Myself, I get treated every year, so um, anyway. So, and then when it comes to genetic diseases, to go back to that, so, Ryan Benton, if anybody's read my book, Ryan is one of my best friend's sons, and he came to us when he was 22 years old. We had, a little, oh, oh, we had a case of Becker's muscular dystrophy that came to us, and that is a form of muscular dystrophy where they have an inhibition or a decreased production of dystrophin, which is the molecule that's missing in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. In Duchenne's, it's less than 5% of the normal amount, 
In, in Becker's, it's 50%. So anyway, the, they tend to get affected later in life. The Shens, usually by the time they're 10, 11, 12 years old, they're in a wheelchair and, and then suffer, suffer greatly after that. Uh, typically, they're on a lot of steroids and then um, you know, their lives in, in prematurely. Um, so our first patient was actually a Becker's patient from Ireland who came and, and um, we treated him, the doctor treated him, and he got so much better, he came back a year later. So when he came, because it affects you later in life. So this guy's was 38 years old, right? So it affects you later in life because you, you have more dystrophin. So you're not, you know, it's not as rapid as a decline. But he came back a year. When he came, he had a, he had a four-pronged cane like this. And he was all bent over because, you know, his muscles were atrophying or disappearing. He came a year later and he walked in erect. I think he did this. I think he did champion. Uh -huh. <laughs> but anyway, this guy came in, and I immediately thought of Ryan, and I called, his, I called his dad, and I said, dude, I don't know if it'll work or not, but I mean, this, this is exactly, you know, if you, it just makes sense, right? This guy had Becker's. He's totally better. Ryan was 22 years old, and his lung function said basically he, he wasn't going to last that much longer. And I said, we can try it, you know? And it's, it's a pretty long story, and I'm going to spare you the details, but it's, it's funny and interesting. It might be in my book. But anyway... He came and we treated him. And now we've been treating him for 15 years. He's 37 years old. His breathing, his brother Blake is here somewhere and they're actually doing a documentary about him. Blake, are you here? Well, anyway, Blake is here somewhere, maybe outside. But these, here's, uh, Sean is your documentary guy. So they're doing a documentary on him. But um, when, when we got a compassionate use IND to treat him in the US, because he'd been coming to Panama and it's, pretty onerous. Uh, we got this compassionate use um, IND from FDA, so we were able to treat him legally in the U.S. And what we noticed was we had, every week we had all these details. There's Blake, by the way. I've been talking about you, buddy. Anyway, so he came every week. They had these, this highly granular data set of his lung function tests and everything else. And what we saw was the original application was to treat him every six months. And what we saw is like, yeah, boom, his, his breathing function went up. Because that's what gets him, right? Breathing function, heart failure, that sort of thing. But his breathing function was exquisitely sensitive to the treatment. And so it went way up. And then in about four and a half months, it started declining. And then by the time we treated him again, it was already back to where he was six months before. So we went to the agency and said, hey, what do you think if we treat him somewhere before that four and a half month port? So they allow us to treat him every three months. And so every three months, we were able to keep his lung function up and he never declined back to baseline. So that's what I get for genetic diseases. It seems like that three to four months. And I, and I got a couple of questions from people about Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. I'd like to address that right now. We do not typically take Parkinson's patients in Panama. We do not typically take Alzheimer's patients. There are currently two clinical trials going on at University of Miami, both doing multi-dosing multi dosing of MSCs for Parkinson's and for Alzheimer's. And the reason we don't take those patients from Panama is because by the time either of those conditions manifests itself, the, the pathology, the problem has advanced to a stage where, so for example, in Parkinson's, once you first see symptoms, 95% of the cells that produce dopamine in your brain are either dead or dying. And so MSCs don't produce dopamine. They don't go to the brain. They don't become dopamine producing cells. They secrete things that can help those cells survive. They, they secrete things that can help other cells in the brain support those cells to survive. And we do see improvements. We have treated a few patients over the years, but we know that those things are going to be fleeting. They're going to last for three or four months. And we, we only have a certain amount of space to treat a certain amount of people and we just think it's, we're better served treating people who can get a very long-term benefit and not somebody who's going to literally chronically treated for the rest of their lives. That's not, that's not, we're not set up for that. Um, so we do not treat either one of those conditions. And that's a lot of the applications we get are for those conditions. We put it on our website in bold that we don't treat those conditions. Um, but, uh, you know, expectedly people in that situation are looking for answers will we'll apply anyway. So, you know, I want to talk a little bit about what, what's different about us. 
I think the number, the biggest difference is we've been there for 16 years. We've treated over 11,000 people. We've given more than 50,000 IV infusions. We have a cell selection process, which is, I can go a little bit into the details on that. We have release criteria that include potency. Who would have thought, right? Yeah, we can say there's so many cells the, the, we know that they, they all turn into, they're, they're all MSCs by the definition of MSCs. We know that 95% of them are, are viable when they're infused. We know all that. But what do they do? Are they capable of doing anything? Because you, you can take an MSC that looks like an MSC and you can run it out here, or you can get a crappy source of it, and it looks perfect, but what does it do? So we do functional assays on the cells. We take human monocytes, white blood cells that produce inflammatory stuff, and we piss them off so they produce inflammatory stuff, and the cells have to be able to shut that, su suppress that, or they don't pass, they don't go. They're not, they're, they're not what we're, they're, they don't have the, what we we're looking for. So we have this ability to do that. So, um, and we have another potency assay of looking at T cells, which in the, in the immunity side, um, they have to be able to suppress that T cell clonal expansion, that, that one slide that I had. If they don't suppress it, they don't go. So that, I think that's a big difference with us. Um, candidate selection process, I just told you about Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's, we don't select. Um, we know what things to exclude. I mean, there are, ALS is another one that re responds, but we just can't, you know, if you take an ALS patient, you have to treat them every three months, Pretty soon you're just going to have a clinic full of ALS patients. Pretty soon you have Parkinson's, et cetera, and we're just not a chronic treatment facility. Um, we have an idea what the cells will work for, and probably what separates us from anybody else do in this space is our number of publications. So I have to take off my glasses. I'm one of those weird people I can't see up close with my glasses. We published, we published papers on, on MSCs for the treatment of, of kidney failure, treatment of uh, multiple sclerosis, multiple papers on MS, um, treatment of, we, we published on the ability of MSCs to inhibit brain tumors growing in rats. That was in preparation for an FDA study that we were doing. Um, we published on autism. Um, you know, this paper, our autism paper, if you guys, I don't know if many of you are scientists, but if, if you average the number of readers for a scientific journal article, the average is three. <laughs> so there's some really good stuff that nobody ever sees out there. So this, uh, our article on, that we wrote in 2007, stem cell therapy for autism, has been downloaded 90,000 times. A little bit, so it's read by a lot of people. We produced, we, we did this one here, and, and this was, we want to show the rest of the world how to grow good cells. So we did all these iterations of how, how to make clinically relevant cells, and we published it. This article came out, I don't know, five years ago. It's been cited 558 times. It's just unbelievable. So most articles don't get cited either. So this one's been cited 558 times. So we publish, the world knows who we are, they know what we're doing, they know how we do it for the most part. So that's probably the biggest difference um, that, between us and others. We also have a selection process, and this is long and detailed and a little bit beyond the scope of this, but back in 2010 to 2012, we spent a lot of time and money figuring out what is the difference between cells that have unbelievable clinical benefit and those that have reasonable clinic ben clinical benefit and those that have zero clinical benefit. And we spent two years growing up all these cells and then we had them analyzed for different molecules that they secrete. And we, f we found that there's a, there's a difference. We, uh, we looked at 1,200 different molecules and there's about a dozen of them that are very, very different. And the ones that have cl high clinical efficacy have this one profile and we're able to use that profile to identify are these cells gonna be clinically efficacious. And so that's, that's another thing that's very different about us. So this is a screenshot from, I think, Wednesday. I don't know if you guys can read that. You can probably read it better than I can. 
But it, it says there, these stem cells, this is a, a clinic in Utah. These stem cells are expanded at Medistem Panama state-of-the-art laboratory. And I can tell you, no, they're not. We don't know anybody in Utah. But this, this copycat syndrome, and we send out a cease and desist letter probably every week or so to some clinic somewhere who's using our stuff and our likeness and, and saying all this BS. So if there's anybody in the US that says they're using our cells or anywhere else in the world outside of Panama, they're not telling the truth. Um, I got this question today, twice. Well, I can go to Mexico and get 300 million sales down there, and they ain't gonna charge me no, no, near as much as you all down in Panama. <laughs> well, the first thing I say is good luck. Because <laughs> I know there's a guy in Mexico, I know there's a guy down in the Caribbean, he'll give you 300 million sales. You ask him to count them for you, you go, what, I ain't counting no damn sales. So most of them don't even have the equipment. The guy down the Caribbean has a, got a water bath, takes those frozen cells, puts them in there, draws them up, shoots them in real fast. Stupidest idea ever. You don't want to shoot them in real fast because it creates turbulence, rips them apart, no bueno, the faster the better. We have done research over the years, and, and it's not just us, but others have shown that a, spreading out the treatment is way better than a bolus every single time. You give some of the cells, you wait a day. Give another some of the cells, wait a day. Give another some of the cells. Uh, you take a single bolus of 120 million cells, divide it by three, and it works twice as well. This 300 million cell thing, uh, I don't know how many times I've heard it, but. So, University of Miami did a study on frailty of aging where they gave 100 million, they did 50 million cells, they did 100 million cells, and they did 200 million cells, and at 50 million, there was some benefit. 100 million, pretty decent benefit. At 200 million, zero benefit. Why that is, I don't know. But it does confirm what we have shown time and time again is you, there are too many cells. You can, give, you can overwhelm the body, body's ability to actually utilize them. And you can actually trigger other things that, that are unintended. But we know the sweet spot's 120 to 140 million cells all day long. And we've been doing that for years, and we get great results. So. So I, I think Dr. Paus said this, uh, he, he went over this study, so I don't really need to cover it, but the main thing is there are two big meta-analyses of mesenchymal stem cell therapy, and they basically showed that they're safe. And then if you look at our numbers of more than 50,000 infusions, our, our rate of, of any adverse reaction, which we record them all, is about 16% across the board. And those 16% are things like fatigue, pain at the side of infusion. Uh, some people get some little chills. Some people feel hot. Some people feel tired. But the average length of an of a, of a adverse event is less than a day, like 0.8 days if you look it all up. So the, the, the good news is these cells, if they're prepared properly and screened properly, can have benefit, and they're not necessarily uh, toxic to anybody. Um, and I think in the future, we need to do randomized controlled trials to sort all this out, and we're, we're on our way. Here we have a, we have a manufacturing facility, and our, and our goal is to do exactly that, randomized controlled trials under FDA, and we are choosing to target orphan conditions uh, for which there's no good treatment. Uh, we don't have a ton of money, so we can't spend $300 million on a clinical trial like a drug company can, but if we have a small enough, uh, small enough population that is an underserved population and we can show a very strong efficacy signal, we think we can get across the line in the next three or four years in the U.S. and we've spent the money we have invested, we have a 37,000 foot manufacturing facility, we have 11,000 under clean room. Uh, my daughter Chloe oversaw the building of that, it's an unbelievable facility. Um, so that's a future for us. Panama, we wanna expand Panama. We're, gonna, we're coming to another country soon. I can't really talk about it right now, 
but we're also talking to partners in the Middle East, potential partners in the Far East, who want to make this as broadly available as we possibly can. So, um, other than that, I just want to tell you I have the best job in the world because I get to meet people like you. I met a bunch of you here today that told me your stories that where you've gone to Panama. Some people, some people here have been to Panama five times. Some people have been here three times. Some people have been there once. Some people are going there next month. Uh, I just went on a trip to the Bahamas with some patients. I, whenever I travel, I find patients wherever I go. I went to Australia a couple years ago with my, my two oldest daughters, and we were feted by these families that have autistic kids that go to Panama. And they, we were going to go to the Gold Coast, we were going to go to Melbourne. We didn't have a minute to spare. We were with them for 12 whole days, and it was wonderful. We got, we got chaperoned around the country. I just went on this trip to the Bahamas. Bryce Anderson, who I thought he was going to be here, he's been to Panama many times. He told a story about his sister six years ago who was on those drugs that I just described for her rheumatoid arthritis, and he was telling that story. He sent her down to Panama. He, his, his sister's husband was an astrophysicist. He couldn't quit his job even though he's 70 years old because they couldn't afford the medications if he lost his health insurance. So Bryce ponied up to pay for him to go down to Panama. She had the treatment. And that was the last time she got any, any rheumatic agent, uh, agent and that, that was six years ago. Um, and then Ian, other guy that's on the boat, he said, oh yeah, I sent, he's, he's been a patient, most of his family's been a patient, he sent two autistic kids to Panama and he was telling us about them. One of them's in normal school now, one of them's younger, had never spoken, after two trips now speaks. So I get, this is my life, and I get to hear all these stories and it brings me so much joy and happiness. And yeah, there's struggles along the way, as say Selena said, but it, nothing, nothing overwhelms that, the happiness and joy I get from helping to help people and, and, and watching them get better and then hear their stories. So I really appreciate all you coming today and thank you very much.